Each of the 142 years in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has been one of growth. But perhaps in no other year has the growth been more dramatic, more in evidence than in The Church in Action, 1972. A year in which one prophet laid aside his earthly labors and another took them up. A year in which six new general authorities were called, two temples dedicated, 26 stakes formed, 44 new regional representatives appointed, and three new missions opened. A year of far-reaching organizational change, of major moves to improve church communications, and of extensive building programs. For some, it was a year of personal tragedy and deep introspection about the fragility of life on Earth. Two new houses of the Lord were dedicated in 1972. The Ogden Temple, the first to be dedicated in Utah in 79 years, was dedicated January 18th by President Joseph Fielding Smith. He was assisted by his counselors, Presidents Harold B. Lee and N. Eldon Tanner. The Provo Temple was dedicated February 9th by President Smith, assisted by his counselors. Nearly 75,000 church members witnessed the dedication on closed circuit television in rooms throughout the temple and in nine buildings on the Brigham Young University campus. Nearly 400,000 persons toured the two temples during open houses in December and January. In the fall, the First Presidency announced plans for major additions and alterations to five temples within the next two years. Idaho Falls, Arizona, Hawaii, Logan, and St. George. In November, the Church News reported that construction of the Washington Temple was on schedule, with completion expected in mid-1974. The seven-story structure, to be capped by six towers of differing heights, overlooks suburban Kensington, Maryland. To better serve the rapidly growing worldwide church membership, the First Presidency announced in June a major new supervisory program. The program is designed to facilitate the supervision and training of leaders, members, and proselyting missionaries. In support of the new program, the First Presidency called 29 brethren to a new position known as Mission Representative. In addition, 36 new regional representatives were called. Nine others were called throughout the year, bringing the total number of representatives of the 12 to 111 at the year's end. President N. Eldon Tanner stated that the organizational changes were made not only to provide for future growth, but to accommodate that which had already taken place. President Tanner indicated that world membership in the church had increased 94% in the past 12 years to 3,090,953 members. South America was setting the pace with a 1,100% increase, followed by Central America with 948% and Asia with 751%. In every month of 1972, except July, one or more new stakes were formed, 26 in all, a record number for a single year. Eight of the new stakes were outside of the United States in Argentina, Mexico, Chile, Brazil, Tahiti, Germany, and Japan. Three new missions were opened in 1972, the Quebec mission, the Argentina East Mission, and the International Mission. Membership of the International Mission, first of its kind in the church, was to consist of church members throughout the world who were outside of organized states and missions and who were not served by any other mission. 
There are no proselyting missionaries within this mission, which has its headquarters in Salt Lake City. Its purpose is to keep scattered church members in close contact with the church through various means, such as organizing them into small groups and branches, supplying needed church materials, and maintaining a close correspondence. A symbol of growth with a nostalgic twist came in Salt Lake City when the old Lyric Theater was restored to its turn-of-the-century Victorian elegance and given a new name, the Promised Valley Playhouse. It was dedicated in August by President Marion G. Romney and houses the pioneer drama Promised Valley, as well as many other theatrical productions. A graphic illustration of church growth in 1972 was the completion and occupancy of Salt Lake City's tallest structure, the 420-foot, 28-story church office building. Designed to house nearly all of the church's departments, the building had been under construction for three years. The church historical department was the first to move in, arriving on November 4th. Six separate moving companies spent three months completing the move into the building. The offices of the First Presidency, the Council of the Twelve, and many other general authorities remained in the church administration building on South Temple. The year 1972 brought the death on July 2nd of President Joseph Fielding Smith and the subsequent ordination of a new president. President Smith's 95 years covered much of the history of the modern world, from prairie schooner to lunar lander. Born July 19, 1876, a year before the death of President Brigham Young, he was the first son and fourth child of President Joseph F. Smith, sixth president of the church, and Julina Lamson Smith. Joseph Fielding Smith was called to the British mission in 1899. And on April 7, 1910, at the age of 33, he was ordained and set apart as a member of the Council of the Twelve by his father, Joseph F. Smith. Joseph Fielding Smith served with uncommon commitment in many important church positions, often holding several offices simultaneously. He was a member of the Young Men's Mutual Improvement Association General Board for 15 years, counselor in the Salt Lake Temple Presidency for 20 years, and Temple President for four years, president of the Genealogical Society for 27 years, church historian for 49 years, theologian and author of 24 church books, a member of the Quorum of Twelve for 60 years, I thank the Lord for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for my membership in the church, for the opportunity which has come to me to give service. And president of the Council of the Twelve for 19 of those 60 years. Counselor in the First Presidency five years, and on January 23rd, 1970, was named 10th president of the church, a position he was to occupy for nearly two and a half years. President Smith was preceded in death by three faithful companions. His body lay in state in the rotunda of the church administration building July 5th, as thousands paid their last respects. At funeral services in the Salt Lake Tabernacle the next day, those who had been privileged to work at President Smith's side spoke of their love for him and of his exemplary life of service to family, church, and fellow men. Clearly, President N. Eldon Tanner said on that occasion, He was called as an apostle of God and became a member of the Twelve about 62 years ago. He served with four presidents of the church and was the last of the general authorities to bridge the gap between the days of Brigham Young and the present generation. Since he became a member of the Twelve, the number of stakes in the church has increased from 62 to 581, 
and the number of members from 393,000 to 3,090,953. The number of missions has increased from about a dozen to 101. He has attended dedica the dedications of 11 of the 13 temples, including St. George and Salt Lake. He passed on his, to his, his heritage to his large, outstanding family, all of whom who have been sealed in the temple of God for time and eternity. He has 11 children, 10 of whom are living, 59 grandchildren, 99 great-grandchildren, making a total of 169 direct descendants. On July 7th, in the Salt Lake Temple, Harold B. Lee was ordained 11th president of the church. When asked what single message he would have for the members of the church, he said, is to keep the commandments of God, for therein lies the, the safety of the church and the safety of the individual. Keep the commandments. There could be nothing that I could say that would be a more powerful or important message today. By the keeping of the commandment, the blessings of heaven come. President Lee named N. Eldon Tanner as his first counselor, and Marion G. Romney as his second counselor. Spencer W. Kimball was named president of the Council of the Twelve. The new first presidency was sustained in the Salt Lake Tabernacle in Solemn Assembly October 6th at the first session of the 142nd Semi-Annual General Conference. The tabernacle was overflowing with representatives from nearly every ward, stake, and mission in the church. They'd lined up in the pre-dawn hours long before the tabernacle doors were opened to assure themselves a place in the simple yet majestic act of sustaining a prophet of God. Sustain Harold Bingham Lee as prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Those in favor will raise their right hands to the square those opposed by the same sign. When the voting was complete, a process requiring about 40 minutes, President Lee then spoke. Today, at the greatest moment of my life, I find myself without words to express my deep and innermost feelings. What I may say, therefore, must be actuated by the Spirit of the Lord that you, my beloved saints, the Most High God, may feel the depths of my soul searching on this momentous and historic occasion. How grateful I am for your loyalty and your sustaining vote. I bear you solemn witnesses to the divine mission of the Savior. At the concluding session on Sunday, President Lee bore his special witness with the warmth, directness, and humility that would become characteristic of many of his addresses. There have come to me, even in these last few days, a deepening and reassuring faith. I can't, I can't leave this conference without saying to you that I have a conviction that the Master hasn't been absent from us on these occasions. This is his church. Where else would he rather be than right here at the headquarters of his church? He isn't, he isn't an absentee master. He's concerned about us. He wants us to follow where he leads. I know that he's a living reality, as is our Heavenly Father. I know it. I only hope that I can qualify to the high place to which he has called me and which you have sustained me. At April conference, John H. Vandenberg, presiding bishop, and Robert L. Simpson, his first counselor, were released from their positions in the presiding bishopric and were sustained as assistants to the Council of the Twelve. Victor L. Brown, former second counselor to Bishop Vandenberg, was sustained as the new presiding bishop. Bishop Brown called as his counselors H. Burke Peterson, a regional representative of the Twelve, and Vaughn J. Featherstall, president of the Boise, Idaho North Stake. During October conference, 
Elder Bruce R. McConkie, who had been a member of the First Council of Seventy since 1946, was called by President Harold B. Lee and sustained as a member of the Council of the Twelve. Elder McConkie filled the vacancy left by the appointment of Elder Marion G. Romney to the First Presidency. Named as assistants to the Twelve were old Leslie Stone, a regional representative and former president of the Salt Lake Temple, James E. Faust, also a regional representative and former president of the Cottonwood Stake, and L. Tom Perry, president of the Boston Stake. Rex D. Penninger, president of the North Carolina-Virginia Mission, was sustained as a member of the First Council of the Seventy, filling the vacancy left by Elder McConkie. The church historian's office was also reorganized and renamed the Church Historical Department, with Alvin R. Dyer as managing director. Leonard J. Arrington was named as church historian, with James B. Allen and Davis Bitton as assistant church historians. Earl E. Olson was appointed church archivist, and Donald T. Schmidt, church librarian. To help fellowship and activate Aaronic priesthood holders over age 21, in January, the First Presidency announced that these men would meet with elders quorums and would be called prospective elders. Late in the year, the First Presidency announced major changes in the organization of the Young Men's and Young Women's Mutual Improvement Associations. To facilitate more meaningful activity programs and to develop stronger priesthood identity, two separate priesthood-oriented organizations were created, the Aaronic Priesthood MIA and the Melchizedek Priesthood MIA. The Aaronic Priesthood MIA will serve youth 12 to 18, and the Melchizedek Priesthood MIA will serve two separate groups, the young adults, unmarried persons 18 through 25, and special interests, unmarried persons 26 and older. Another auxiliary, the Sunday School, experienced change in 1972. To encourage stronger priesthood identity, the executive title superintendent was changed to president, a change that also applied to the MIA. An eight-year course series on the standard works began churchwide in 5,000 adult Sunday School classes in September. In December, the First Presidency announced the formation of the Church Music Department. This department will direct all facets of church music, including the Youth Symphony and Choir, the Tabernacle Choir, and will correlate all music activities with other church departments. To meet the pressing communications needs of a growing church, the First Presidency created directorships for internal and external church communications. In January, Elder J. Thomas Fiennes, a regional representative of the Twelve, was appointed Managing Director of Internal Communications. Elder Fiennes will be responsible for planning, preparing, translating, printing, and distributing communications, instructional materials, and periodicals within the church. The work of Elder Fiennes and the Internal Communications Department includes distribution of nearly 6,000 different categories of printed matter. To aid in this work, distribution centers have been established throughout the world, from Brazil to Tonga, from Frankfurt to Hong Kong. In November in Salt Lake City, President Lee presided at the dedication of a new 177,000 square foot distribution center and supply store. In August, Wendell J. Ashton, a prominent Salt Lake advertising executive and a member of the Sunday School General Board for 21 years, began his duties as managing director of external communications. Elder Ashton directs the department which communicates church activities and teachings to the worldwide general public through the news media, motion pictures, literature, visitor centers, pageants, and exposition exhibits. 38 health missionaries were called to serve in 24 countries during the year, bringing the total of such missionaries to 40.
There were other changes, other signs of growth in the church throughout 1972. The selection of J. Spencer Kennard as the voice of the spoken word. The naming of Elder Theodore M. Burton as president of the Genealogical Society. The opening of a new 16-bed mental health facility at Primary Children's Hospital. The establishment of the Richard L. Evans Chair of Christian Understanding at Brigham Young University. The dedication of the San Diego Visitor Center. The 125th anniversary of the pioneers entering Salt Lake Valley, celebrated in the 24th of July Pioneer Days Parade. In October, presiding Bishop Victor L. Brown announced a new name and expanded responsibilities for the welfare program. Henceforth, he said, it would be known as welfare services and would combine welfare, social services, and health services on a ward and state basis. In 1971, worldwide church welfare assistance amounted to $18 million. Members and non-members alike gained an appreciation of the extent of worldwide welfare services as the church responded to major tragedies. Underground, special expert crews are going to work trying to locate the missing miners. The next of kin are being notified as the dead men are identified. The shock of learning of certain tragedy is paralleled by the strain of waiting without any word at all. Kellogg, Idaho, May 3rd. Fire struck America's richest silver mine, the Sunshine Mine, killing 91 men, including 15 members of the church. Nine families in the Wallace Ward lost loved ones, as did six families in the Kellogg Ward. The Wallace Ward Bishop said that in the days following the tragedy, state members brought food into the areas by the truckload. The supplies filled our needs and brought comfort to many non-members as well as members. Rapid City, South Dakota, June 9th. The worst flood in America in 35 years inundated Rapid City, killing hundreds and leaving 3,000 homeless. Five church members were among the dead. As soon as the president of the Rapid City Second Branch learned of the flood threat, he began calling his families and telling them to evacuate. Those he couldn't reach by phone, he contacted in person by driving to their homes. Assistance arrived in the form of two plane loads of clothing from Denver, Colorado. Money and missionary assistance came from the Montana, Wyoming, and North Indian missions, and seven and a half tons of food and clothing came from Salt Lake City. On December 23rd, an earthquake of great intensity struck Managua, Nicaragua, killing thousands. The church's 28 missionaries were evacuated by air to mission headquarters at San Jose, Costa Rica. Within three days, the Costa Rica district presidency had sent 45 tons of foodstuff, as well as canvas shelters, to the stricken Nicaraguan member families. Throughout 1972, in less dramatic but equally critical moments in people's lives, Individual church members and welfare services personnel went quietly, selflessly, about the business of being of service to those physically, emotionally, socially, and spiritually in need. As the church has grown, it has reached out to its worldwide membership in multiple ways, including the Area General Conference. The second such conference was held in the 18,000-seat National Auditorium in Mexico City, August 25th, 26th, and 27th. Nearly 17,000 Latter-day Saints from Mexico and Central America attended the conference, sometimes at great sacrifice, coming from distances as far as 3,000 miles. They journeyed by car, bus, and plane from Panama, Honduras, Costa Rica, and throughout Mexico. 
The conference began on Friday evening with a program of entertainment. Mis amados hermanos y hermanas, me siento muy feliz. The opening general session on Saturday morning was conducted in Spanish to the delight of the members by President Marion G. Romney. All of the first presidency were in attendance for the Saturday evening sessions and the Sunday general sessions. The Tabernacle Choir broadcast its Sunday morning program for the auditorium just prior to the conference session. On Sunday morning, the Mexican and Central American members had the privilege of being the first to sustain President Lee and his counselors at a general conference. My beloved brethren and sisters, Mis amados, it is good to be back in Mexico among the warm spirited, no friendly people of Latin America. Bueno es poder estar nuevamente en México entre la gente the saints were admonished to strive for spirituality to be willing to sacrifice and to keep the commandments. Speakers included President Lee, President N. Eldon Tanner, members of the Council of the Twelve and assistants to the Twelve, as well as regional representatives and the presidents of five stakes in Mexico and Central America. One sister from northwestern Mexico scrubbed her neighbor's clothes for five months to earn enough pesos to make the trip. Others worked nights, borrowed money, or sold their belongings. Once in Mexico City, many could not afford the two pesos for cots, so they slept the three nights on hardwood gymnasium floors. Still, as these saints gathered to attend a conference of the church in their own land, they were often heard to say, Es un sueño. It is a dream. All of the events associated with the Church in Action 1972 are significant and meaningful in and of themselves. But in a larger historical sense, they are significant in another way. They show greater progress, greater growth for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as the joyous message of the restored gospel continues to fill the earth. <laughs> 